I'm Patrick McLamey, author of Designing a World-Class Architecture Firm and former CEO of HOK, and you are listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. You don't typically think of bridges as architecture, not like highway overpasses in particular. There are some 600,000 in the U.S., with only a few dozen that get anybody excited, and most of those, like the Golden Gate Bridge and the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, were built nearly 100 years ago. Wow. Today, from the U.K., we welcome Martin Knight, an architect whose heralded bridges worldwide create portals to cities while helping cars, trains, and pedestrian traffic move from one place to another. And now, despite the fact that I deep cleaned the studio, put on a bespoke hazmat suit, and put Lysol in his latte, just like the president told me, I still couldn't get him to leave his house. So, from home, where I'm sure there's a photo of Bjarke Ingels on the wall, it's your host, George Smart. Hi, folks. It's week eight of the quarantine, and to my surprise, I've been busier than ever. Although we can't do tours, obviously, U.S. Modernist has been working on a gift from a major university of 200,000 pages of architecture magazines that we'll be scanning for the U.S. Modernist Library online. We've been giving away architecture books and DVDs and polo shirts and grocery bags at U.S. Modernist on Instagram almost every day. And I want to thank all the intrepid volunteers at home for helping us research houses at usmodernist.org. If you'd like to help, email Carrie, that's C-A-R-I-E, at usmodernist.org. As Tom said, I'm in my home office with a variety of cords, lights, microphones, and computers all strewn about. One outcome of COVID is that everyone eventually will have a home studio, (laughs) either through their phone or their laptops. I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but... It's happening. It's a crazy time, but I'm glad that all of you are out there listening and enjoying U.S. Marnish Radio. If you'd like to get our newsletter, you can subscribe at usmarnish.org. There's a link there to get on the newsletter. Support for U.S. Marnish Radio comes from Modernist Realtor Angela Roll and Nietzscheha.com slash U.S. Modernist. exterior look and any color wood concrete your house loves feeling this good and you love feeling this good Nietzsche 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 say it with me Nietzsche advanced engineering Nietzsche Nietzsche durability textures finishes Visit Nietzsche.com slash U.S. Modernist. Nietzsche, Nietzsche, Nietzsche. That's in. I. C. So relaxing. It really is. Martin Knight is one of the world's leading bridge architects. Founded in 2006, his firm won several high-profile international design projects, including the world-record-breaking Hong Kong-Macau Bridge, a 380-meter-long timber footbridge in Austria, 
railway bridges linking Germany and Poland, and what will soon be the longest bridge in Helsinki, Finland, among other projects. He joins us today from just outside of London in a cool, modernist place called Taplo, an award-winning 1966 area designed by Eric Lyons. Welcome, Martin. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Before we get started on bridges, I want to know more about Taplo. Uh, okay. Uh, well, the first thing I should explain is it's not a sort of modernist um, haven. We have uh, a little estate here of 24 houses set in a relatively small village that dates back to Georgian times. So oh, our okay. houses were very much the, the shock of the new. They are quite unlike anything around us and were hugely unpopular when they were first built. Like any like any good modernist right. uh, piece of Absolutely. architecture, everybody hated it. It's said here that they're award-winning. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They are award-winning. They are fantastic. But just nobody realized it. It took them 50 years to realize. Who was Eric Lyons? He's a new name for me. Uh, he was an innovator. He was one of the first architect developers, and he co-founded a, a company called Span Developments. And they they developed a series of mostly residential developments during the uh, late 50s and 60s and on into the 70s, in fact. And the name span reflected the idea that they were spanning between bespoke houses, one-off houses, and mass housing. So their, their sort of span product was typically estates of 25, 30, 40, or 50 houses. Uh, and they did these across the southeast of, uh, of England for 10 or 15 years. Eric Lyons himself was at one time the president of the Royal Institute of British Architects. So he was a revered character as well as a brilliant architect. Was he one of these modernist architects that Prince Charles complained about during the 70s? Uh, no, I think he, he probably set the ground for Prince Charles to hate, uh, hate, hate the, uh, the modernist <laughs> architects. He, he, had, he had some great ideas, though. The, uh, this estate, like many of them, was designed hand-in-hand -hand with uh, a, a landscape architect, in this case, Ivor Cunningham. And so the interior and the exterior of all the houses, all the gardens, and the land that they're set in uh, are all a, a coordinated kind of composition. Nearby to where you live in Tableau is one of your bridges, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, less than half a mile as the crow flies from, from where I live. So it, it was a high profile and high pressure project. When did that get completed? That was completed uh, about 18 months ago. So it's been open for a little while now and it's had plenty of traffic. Uh, it's a little footbridge, so it's not a, uh, not a major piece, but um, important locally. A question I've always had, Martin, and I'm sure you know the answer to this is, how do people select where to put footbridges? Because, you know, with highways, you kind of know where the highway is going to cross the river or where the rail line is going to have to cross the river. But footbridges, you have a lot more flexibility. So how do you select the optimum place for a footbridge to go? Oh, they vary context by context. But um, I, I think you have to ask a number of questions. Primarily, you have to ask why and who. So why are we doing this project and who's it for? And that starts to guide your response to the to the setting. Uh, as you say, I mean, uh, footbridges are, are far more flexible than, than highway bridges or railway bridges. So you, you've got a, a degree more opportunity to react creatively to a site. But nevertheless, it's got to be in the right place. If it isn't perfectly aligned and, and absolutely suited, then people won't use it. Who was the client for the bridge near you in Taplow? The the one near to us was a, a housing developer. Uh, so they they uh, built out an old paper mill site that was uh, really post industrial, in, in terrible rundown state, and that really needed some kind of regeneration. So they they did that, and as part of that project, uh, there was a plan published very early with a dotted line that said potential future footbridge. And uh, I saw the opportunity and also the, um, the burden uh, from the outset that people would say, come on, bridge guy, what's it going to be? <laughs> <laughs> sure. 
show us something I mean, good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you couldn't exactly let one of your competitors do a bridge in your backyard. <laughs> that didn't even occur to me. No, of course, of course. Uh, and <laughs> nor, nor could we make a lousy project. So it had to be beautiful. Uh, and it was, as it turned out, um, coincidentally, the, the, the neighboring member of parliament or the, the member of parliament of the neighboring town was asked to to open it and at the time her name was Theresa May so uh, oh. we, we had it opened wow. by the prime minister which was quite something and how competitive is the bridge business anyway the bridge designing business uh it it's very competitive but i would say in a friendly way uh it's a small um a small crowd of us there aren't that many bridge architects, um, and we tend to to support each other and, and gather around because um, the the competition really is not each other. The competition is people who don't see the need for architecture in the world of infrastructure and bridges in particular. Now, how did you get into bridges, Martin? Did it come out of a course of study, or did you just get your first one and then never look back? I think more the latter. I, I I always have been a fairly practical person. Um, my background from school or after school was on construction sites. So I liked building stuff and uh, th that meant that I wanted to know how they went up and the, the engineering behind things. And uh, I was working at a company called Hopkins Architects uh, in the, in the mid nineties and was sat next to a partner who took a phone call inviting the company to participate in a bridge competition. And he turned to me afterwards and said, right, guess what you're working on? <laughs> and, uh, and that was that. And, and the, the, the great good fortune I had was that that first competition, we were teamed with uh, a British engineer called Atkins and a German engineer called Schleich Bergmann. And so the very first bridge engineer I met in the world was Professor Jörg Schleich, who is the preeminent bridge engineer worldwide. So uh, without knowing it, I started right at the top. So you met the Obi-Wan Kenobi first day, pretty much. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I don't think he will remember it quite as <laughs> impressively <laughs> as I did. <laughs> you went to the US in the 80s, right, to, to see architecture. What kind of things did you discover when you toured around America? Oh crumbs! When I went to the states in the eighties, was that was uh, that was fresh out of high school. So that really was just seeing the world, and the world for me was was North America. So we went coast to coast, north and south. We we travelled mostly by Greyhound bus. We cadged lifts, um, thumb thumbed rides all over the place, and it was um, more about just being immersed in culture than about seeing sites. I was so far from being an architect at that point. It was just experience. But but I have to say, a visit to the Golden Gate Bridge, walking, uh, nobody walks to the Golden Gate Bridge, but we walked from the Presidio or fr from downtown to the Golden Gate Bridge, halfway across, and it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. So that, that was kind of, in hindsight, I'd like to think of it as a seminal moment, but I certainly didn't recognize it at the time. I read, though, that you did a tour of the U.S. at some point, maybe it was later, seeing case study houses. Ah, yes, yeah, sorry, back on track. Uh, case study houses were became something very, very important for me during my diploma, so my second degree. So that would have been in the, uh, in the early 90s. And Esther McCoy had not long previously written a book about the case study houses, and I think there'd been a touring exhibition. And I was obsessed by the Eames House. I thought that was just the most fantastic piece of architecture. And actually going on to work for Hopkins, they were also very much influenced by Eames. So I scored an opportunity at university to be funded for a trip to Los Angeles. This was 94. It was just after the Northridge earthquake. So I combined a, a project about earthquake resilience and an opportunity to visit um, some of the case study houses. So that, that, was, uh, that was how that came together. Which ones did you go visit beside the Eames? Do you remember? Uh, the Eames house I went to twice. We were really, really unsuccessful in finding others. Uh, and uh, the, we, I wanted to see Koenig Project. Uh, I wanted to see Elwood, the Elwood house. 
Firstly, we couldn't find one, and the other one we got chased off. So um, modernist houses, I think, in that part of um, Los Angeles or Beverly Hills, to be more precise, were fairly well protected at the time, unsurprisingly. There are more people wandering around now, I think, because they're a little bit more famous over the years. There was a fairly well-beaten track at the time. I, certainly, we found the Eames house because we were about the fifth or sixth people to go there that day. Oh. Um, and this was, before, <laughs> this was before it was open to the public. But they were very charming. But there, there, were other, there were all kinds of sort of collateral projects at the same time that I was interested in. I, I went to see Dennis Hopper's house in, in Venice. The Frank the, Gehry the house. Early, the Frank Gehry one, yeah, which was just... Yes. Uh, so brilliantly banal. It was so cool. I loved that house. So when we go back to bridges here, Martin, how do you sell people on investing more than the minimum in a bridge? Because you could certainly build an ugly one for not much. How do you get them to, <laughs> to you know, fund it properly? It's the, it's the perennial problem. I mean, if you ask an engineer, why do you need an architect? to design a bridge, he'll say you don't. But if you ask an architect, they'll say, why do you need a bridge? <laughs> and it's about the the opening of, a, of an opportunity. How, how big can this story be? The other thing that I think is, is absolutely vital, and increasingly clients are recognizing this, uh, what we, uh, as bridge designers, what we have to do is, is fulfill um, much more onerous building criteria than for uh, for regular architects. So our structures have to last 120 years. And in reality, that means um, much, much longer. So they're going to outlast us by many, many generations. And these are structures that people use and rely upon every single day. So if you don't do those well, you're not really contributing to society. In fact, you're making uh, the environment that we all rely upon worse and worse. So there is uh, increasing recognition of the social value of high quality infrastructure and how that ties communities to place a sense of identity and a sense of value. And the engineering is only part of it. It's the design and the aesthetics as well, or even the placement. Uh, The placement is definitely part of it. I would say that the aesthetics and the engineering in a perfect bridge are completely interwoven. Uh, we do a lot of projects with with engineers all around the world. We've got so many good friends in the world of engineering. And those those projects that we look back on that we really, really enjoy, that we feel we got absolutely perfect, are the ones where you cannot tell the stroke of one person's pen. It's, uh, it's not the architect, it's not the engineer, the project or the design is so uh, in harmony with its context and with its setting that it it looks like it was always there. That's the, the 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 best solution. And if you try and go for your cheap, your standard, low cost uh, solution, and then you employ the architect to apply the uh, the lipstick to that, um, you're still going to get uh, an ugly structure just with lipstick on it. <laughs> yeah, we we know that expression here. It's called lipstick on the pig. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. You mentioned earlier, Martin, that there's a a small group of specialist bridge architects. Who would those people be? I know Santiago Calatrava is one of them. He he certainly is one of them. He um, he probably opened the door for the rest of us. To be perfectly honest, Um, Calatrava is revered in some quarters and not so popular in others. And I I think if if you're responsible for the maintenance of one of his structures or for the financing of it, you may have different uh, opinions. But I think overall, Calatrava raised the bar for bridge architecture. And really, uh, certainly pre-millennium, there were almost no cities around the world who were considering doing something flamboyant with infrastructure. And it was Calatrava that changed that. Kind of like Frank Gehry did with the Guggenheim and Bilbao for museums. Exactly. Yes. Uh, and the city mayors around the world who had aspirations to, to demonstrate that their city was was on the up, uh, they, they saw infrastructure as uh, potentially a cheaper way of achieving it than a Guggenheim. One of your projects was, I think, the, the world record holder, the, the Hong Kong-Macau bridge tunnel system? Is that still the longest? 
That is uh, one of the longest, I think it's the longest sea crossing in the world. Um, I, I wouldn't claim it as one of our projects. It's a project upon which we worked. So we okay. were involved in several of the major cable say bridges on, on that crossing and ultimately did, were the executive architect for the uh, cable stay bridge at Chu Hai Port. And that whole span is what, 30 miles or longer? Uh, yeah, 34 miles end to end. It's 55 kilometers. So I think that's 34 miles. And there are three major cable stay bridges that are the navigation channels. But then the main navigation channel itself goes over uh, the crossing. Uh, and there, there were two man-made islands created and the, the, uh, the highway disappears into the sea. And are there tunnels as well? Those man-made islands are linked by uh, by tunnels. By tunnels, okay. And is it for just cars or cars and trains? Uh, it's just for cars. Uh, it, it's uh, it's part of a uh, a new coastal highway system that connects Hong Kong with the mainland Chinese city of Chu Hai, and then on to the resort city of Macau. Okay, because I know before then you had to take what a hour and a half ferry voyage to get from Hong Kong to Macau? Uh, there was frequent high-speed ferries. They took around an hour, I think. Um, and uh, every time I went there, you'd, I'd fly into Hong Kong airport and you'd go from the airport terminal straight to the ferry and, and you'd cross the, uh, cross the mouth of the Pearl River. Uh, to Chu Hai. So it was, um, yeah, it was, it was a, a, quite a, a serious undertaking, especially when the weather was bad. But it's one of the sort of um, penalties of being a bridge designer is that for reasons I, I simply don't understand, every single site office I've ever worked at has been on the opposite side of the thing that we're bridging. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously the bridge isn't there until we're finished. So well, they uh, want I, you to finish my... the job. <laughs> you know? I, I never thought of it, the incentivization. Right. You have to mount an incredible amount of equipment uh, to, to do a bridge. I mean, I don't know how it is in the UK, but we have lots of TV shows on cable TV like um, Modern Marvels is one that shows the engineering required to build these bridges and other structures. It, it's really nothing short of amazing, some of the machines that are used. What are some of the most interesting devices for design and construction that you see building these bridges? Well, I, I honestly think that one of the most unsung but most creative roles is, the, is that of the temporary works designer on a, on a major bridge. It's one thing to design what the structure may be for, for the final condition, but how do you get it there? That's the, that's the grand question. And it's just it's so exciting seeing a, a very large bridge hanging from a hook. <laughs> um, I remember, well, we, in fact, we have a project on site in the Lake District in the north of England right now, which is going to be installed in a, a couple of days' time. That is a, a 50 meter highway bridge, and that's going to be lifted in in one piece, which is that's that's so exciting. And it's got this most enormous crane. You can see the crane from the other end of the lake. But um, going back, I've worked on bridges. Uh, the Gateshead Millennium Bridge was installed by the world's second largest floating crane, uh, which was extraordinary. That was a thousand ton lift. Um, I'm, I How always, much does it cost to rent the uh, the second largest crane per day? <laughs> like if I wanted to just have it for an afternoon, Martin? I, I have no idea. I, the, the, that's the last thing they'd tell the architect, but I reckon it costs less than the, than the largest crane. You could uh, rent it as a, be a bungee jump. Yeah, exactly. Over, yeah, yeah. But you also see there, there are all kinds of innovations nowadays. There, there, there are these multi-wheeled uh, transporters where they, they keep on adding uh, another powered wheel, another powered wheel until they've got the capacity. And you can drive structures into position, jack them up and move them around really, really easily now. And, and so where in the past most large structures would be constructed in situ, often at height and usually very dangerously, Nowadays, uh, an awful lot of the, the, the construction is done away from the site, 
brought to site in modular pieces and then assembled in a way that is much more efficient, much safer, and much more cost-effective. When we come back, more about bridges. So while well, George sneaks out for some extra crispy Cheez-Its, because we're all out of bridge mix here, they are incredibly <laughs> good, by the way. Here are more Outer Space Adventures of Modernist Realtor, Angela Roll. Welcome to Episode 5, Revenge of the McMansions. It is a dark time for the modernist rebels. Bulldozer ships from the Empire continue to attack modernist houses across the galaxy and turn them into massive Italianate villas. Evading the Empire's fleet, a group of freedom fighters led by Princess Angela Roll establish a base in Palm Springs, just in time for happy hour. Cheers. Not a bad place to have a rebel base. Brad Vader, Darth's half-brother, who went into mortgage banking, obsessed with finding the rebel princess. Well, well, Brad refuses to further finance modernist construction and only gives loans to houses over 10,000 square feet. Meanwhile, the princess ancestor, modernist realtor Angela Roll, uses the force of her real estate and architectural training to specialize in modernist houses, advising buyers and sellers on everything from appropriate renovation to finding a great tapas restaurant in any major city on earth. That last part is true. Reach Angela Roll at AngelaRoll.com, that's R-O-E-H-L, or call her 919-995-0550, or just send a holy ram. Welcome back. We're talking with Martin Knight, noted bridge architect. Martin, here's some statistics for you. According to the 2017 report card for America's infrastructure, the U.S. has about 600,000 bridges, with 40% 50 or more years old. Wow. 9% of all the bridges were found to be structurally deficient. But that doesn't stop the 188 million trips across them every year. It could cost more than $120 billion to repair, but funding is not even close to that amount. Is it the same way in the UK and Europe, or are we just bad stewards of our bridges here? Uh, no, I think you've got a larger country. <laughs> well, that is true. <laughs> um, r- rather more, rather more structures. I mean, the, the the fact is that as as we've expanded in Europe, as we've expanded in the states, uh, we build more and more bridges. They're absolutely central to our movement around our connectivity and our daily lives. And as towns and cities boomed. All of those structures were built around the same time. So in in Europe, a lot of them were built post-war, immediately post-Second World War. Uh, Those are now reaching the upper end of their lifespan, and I guess the same is true in the States. We did bomb a lot of bridges back in the Second World War, so uh, we were paving the way in in a sense. (laughs) I guess it's karma for that now, yeah. So technically, Martin, how do bridges deteriorate? What makes them go bad? Well, like uh, like any structure, if you constantly load it and then unload it, you creating fatigue. And so most uh, most structures that go through a loading cycle can only absorb so much fatigue before they uh, they reach the end of their service life. But the, the the challenge is then to design something that doesn't have loads of redundant service life built into it. Otherwise, you're just creating uh, unnecessarily energy hungry and carbon hungry structures. So this is where smart design comes in. Good design uh, is efficient and long lasting. So tell our listeners who have no idea what BIM is, what BIM is and your concern about it becoming like Twitter for architecture. I sense you might have read one of my papers. <laughs> yes, I have. Okay. Oh no. Uh, okay, I'm I'm hoist by my own petard. <laughs> BIM or building information modeling or bridge information modeling is uh, a modern system or standard for sharing construction information through the use of 3D computer models. Um, yes. They are multi user models. Um, people can work on them simultaneously, they can work on them from different locations. Uh, the more complex variants of the model can have all kinds of characteristics added to the model. So we're not simply talking about the 3D definition of something, you're talking about the material characteristics uh, and all kinds of components like that. So it's a very sophisticated and very powerful way of sharing information. 
And the paper I wrote speculated on whether in creating such a powerful tool, we were removing some of the authorship and some of the sense of personal ownership of design, which I think is actually something that's really important and really central to architecture and and bridge architects in particular. Is it essentially that we're making design kind of a commodity that's anonymous versus being associated with somebody like you or others? It's not so much about the personality behind it, um, although uh, obviously everyone loves a Calatrava or a Bjark Ingalls. The thing that's more important now, as far as I'm concerned, is the ownership of that information relieves the author from some kind of um, specific uh, response to sight. So people become uh, more obsessed with the the model itself, what is the model, and less interested in what is the world into which that model is going to be placed. It becomes acontextual. So in a sense, they just want to go pull something out of the BIM shelf that's already done rather than thinking more critically about the location of where this bridge is going to go. Is that your point? Yes, exactly. I mean, this comes back to the questions that we always promote on any project. Why is the project necessary? Who is it going to serve are the two most important ones. But I feel that BIM tends to focus much more on what and who uh, and how. So what is the what's the design? How is it going to be built? And those two, in doing that, you exclude the user very much from the conversation. And BIM is a particularly sophisticated tool, and the language of BIM is, is very powerful. But you have to know that language. You have to speak that language. Now, the general public and a lot of other people don't within the industry don't speak that language. And because of that, they're excluded from the conversation. And I, I don't feel that is wholly positive. What would be a a solution to make that better? Well, I would say this, but I think involving an architect in infrastructure design is really important because we quite often speak a broader language and we're natural communicators. And the world of engineering is predominantly about uh, highly efficient problem solving. Engineers are fantastic at solving problems, at closing down opportunities until you find that the absolute perfect solution. Architects are trained the other way around. We, we like to open up op- opportunities. We like to open up dialogue. And if you bring those two skill sets together, you get much more powerful solutions and much better solutions that fit with their context. So the engineers are not asking the question so much, why do we have a bridge or what are we going to use it for? They're just figuring out how to build whatever it is you've requested. Quite often, I find that's that's true. Um, that there's a rush to explore options, but at a superficial level, and then to develop and hone down and value engineer and remove all of the joy from the thing uh, until you're left with a very standardized solution. Martin, is there a bridge too far? A span people want to build, but they haven't figured out how to make it work yet. <laughs> Um, Certainly in Europe, there are a number that keep on coming up from time to time. There's uh, there's the the famous Mazzina Bridge uh, in Italy, which links or is proposed to link the the toe of Italy to Sicily. Uh, This would be the longest span in the world by some margin, and it's been promoted for for many years. Um, Decades, yes. Indeed. The problem with that scale of structure, certainly for free spans, is that the, the majority of the structure is is required simply to hold up the structure. So you 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 start chasing your tail in terms of efficiency. More recently, there have been um, post Brexit in the UK. You may have heard of it. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. We, we've been uh, frantically trying to extract ourselves from Europe, and then uh, the minute that um, that happens. People start to suggest ways of creating bridges back into Europe. So, uh, a bridge across the English Channel from from England to France, uh, a bridge linking Scotland to Northern Ireland. So, I think that illustrates to me the the kind of political nature of bridges, the political nature of making connections. 
How about vertically, Martin? Can we build a bridge upwards, <laughs> say, to a space station? <laughs> That's a long span. That would be that would be a super long span. I, I think it's been proven to be possible, but I, I tend to focus on um, horizontal spans, not vertical ones. I, I left that part of my education behind me a long, long time ago. <laughs> Plus, isn't the space station, is, it's not geostationary, right? It's orbiting. Well, that's just a detail, Tom. Come on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know that there's a, this idea of a space elevator, which is essentially a bridge upwards to end yeah, at yeah. either a, a station that would move with it, or it would just be a, a terminus point where ships could come from around and dock at the end of it. It's essentially a single-ended bridge, though, isn't it? It's a yeah. it's a vertical pier. Yes. Uh, yeah. So yes. Uh, we 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 I, we only design bridges with two ends. So right. I, I couldn't couldn't comment on that. I do. It does make me think of a competition-winning scheme that we saw uh, a few years ago, where a well-respected British engineer said, I, "I love the design. It's fantastic and would work wonderfully in conditions of zero gravity." Oh. <laughs> Well, for these really long bridges, like the one supposedly going from the tip of Italy to Sicily, is there a minimum number of, I don't know, islands, artificial or natural, that would have to be created to help along the way, structurally? Uh, no, the, the Italian bridge is, is a single span. That's what makes it so extraordinary. But uh, Is it going to happen? Uh, I would say in the in the current economic climate and for the foreseeable future, I doubt it very much. But well, um, one of the things with with bridge design, like tall buildings, is never say never. What do you get involved in as far as bridges for heavy things, Martin, like trains or trucks or something other than cars and people? We, we we've worked on all kinds of bridges, small, intimate pedestrian structures, huge uh, sort of cross-sea bridges for, for highway vehicles, heavyweight structures for, uh, for railways and railroads. Um, Airplanes. And I've worked on a design that was built at Gatwick Airport for a, a bridge that crosses over a, uh, not a runway, but a, a taxiway. Yeah, uh, and of course, uh, for for those situations where the bridge has to get out of the way, uh, we've designed a lot of movable structures as well. So you mean like portable bridges that you set up temporarily, that kind of thing? Or draw bridges? Yeah, draw bridges is more the uh, the, the the frame of reference, but. Um, there are various types of bridges that uh, provide connectivity, typically for highways uh, or for pedestrians, but then you have to move them out of the way right. to let uh, shipping go past. I hate drawbridges. Why is that? You know, well, you know, if you're driving somewhere and, oh, especially around D.C. and the drawbridge is up, you know, then you're delayed. The heck with the boat or whatever it is that's going through. But surely it's that's okay, an Tom. opportunity to marvel at the engineering and the architecture <laughs> oh. in front of you. I, you have a point. I'll need to do that next time. It's an opportunity to be savored. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Martin, thank you so much for joining us. I know it is evening where you are in the UK, and it's been such a pleasure to chat with you and learn more about bridges. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure to be on. Thanks for listening. U.S. Marnish Radio is underwritten by Angela Roll, your special real estate agent for modernist houses, and by Nichiha.com slash U.S. Modernist. Okay, Tom, close us out. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 7,000 modernist houses, and access 2.8 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Carrie Chessarino researches guests while juggling two children, a bowling ball, and a chainsaw, all while salsa dancing with her husband, Adam. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. 
I'm Tom Guild, George, and I'll be back soon with another Bridge Too Far, Bridge Over the River Kwai, Bridge of Spies, Bridges of Madison County, The Girl on the Bridge, Bridge Over Troubled Water edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. Sail on, Silver.